So we're looking at 18.2 today, which is variation in phenotype. Now we know that phenotype is going to change because of course for each gene we've got different alleles. But even when people have got the same alleles, their phenotype is different. And a lot of that has to be down to environmental factors. Factors, we've got three things that can very much change the uh, phenotype. One of them is mutations. Um, not all mutations are passed on to the offspring. Of course, they've got to take place within the uh, gametes. We've got meiosis, which is the random segregation of the chromosomes and also crossing over. And then within that, we've got random fertilization. Each sperm could combine with uh, the egg. And so there's a lot of uh, variation that's due to the genetic factors. But then on top of that, we've got the environment which will affect the genetic factors. So let's think about that. Say for instance, you've got an individual who's genetically predisposed to be tall, uh, but they grow up in a deprived environment and they don't have a proper diet, then they're not gonna reach their full potential and the environment will affect the genetic factors that they've got. There are only a few factors that can be attributed to a single gene. And when you look at those in more detail, so for example, the blood groups, you've got A, B, a, B uh, and O. Well, what you get then when you plot the population is you get distinct data that would be expressed on a bar chart. Remember, a bar chart has spaces in between the bars. So this one might be A, for example, this one might be O, this one might be A, B, and this one might be B. They're distinct because they're controlled by one type of gene um, which has various forms of the, of the allele. It's more typical that characteristics and therefore phenotypes are controlled by polygenes. And what we mean by those are a mixture of genes that contribute towards that characteristic or that phenotype. And then on top of that, again, you've got the environment. So if you look at a large enough sample size, what you will always get is what we call the normal distribution. You'll get a few at the low end, you'll get a lot in the middle, and you'll get a few at the high end. So if we were looking at height, for example, you're gonna get a few short people in the ear, you're gonna get a few tall people in the ear, in the ear group, and you're gonna get a lot that are kind of average. So this would be number of individuals and this would be height in centimetres. Of course, the normal distribution is used to decide what grade you're going to get at GCSE. So obviously they've changed from the A, the B, the C now, but you'll get a, very, a few people at the lower end who get a very small percentage You'll get a lot of people in the middle, and then you'll get a few people who attain a high grade. And so what they'll do then is they'll say, okay, they are our level nine, they are our level eight, they are our level seven, they are our level six. Most people will get a level five, some will get a level four, three, two, and then one. And this is why it's, we're unable to say, 80% is, is, a, is a seven, or 70% in a test is a six, because depending on the cohorts and depending on the normal distribution, that curve might lay in a completely different place. So for example, if I just remove that, for example, on last year's biology test, um, the curve must have been really low because the grade boundaries were really low. In previous years, you've needed a much higher percentage because the normal distribution has been skewed to the right. So in summary, the main point of this is if when you plot your data that you get when you're looking at a particular phenotype, if you get the normal distribution, you can be sure that you're looking at a phenotype that's comprised of many genes, in other words, polygenes. 
If you get data that's discrete, then we know it's a phenotype as a result of one gene only. Yeah.